I'll turn that on. Look at that. Hello and welcome to the Committee of the Whole meeting for Monday, December 2nd. Fun fact, it is the last Committee of the Whole meeting for the Council of, uh, for City Council as we move into the new schedule for the new year. Um, so I'm going to start today. Um, my name is Tanil Bonagor. I'm the Ward Councillor for Ward 7. For anyone who's new to Chambers, the Mayor is here. He is on my left. <laughs> So we would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather today is the land traditionally used by the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe and neutral people. We also acknowledge the enduring presence and deep traditional knowledge and philosophies of the indigenous people with whom we share this land today. So to get us started, um, I ask for the disclosure of any pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof. Looking around, I see none. So I ask for the approval of minutes for the November 4th Committee of the Whole meeting. Do I have someone? Councillor Hanmer, uh, Councillor Freeman, second. Uh, all in favour? That's everyone. Thank you. And that gets us tidily onto our delegations. First today, we have a delegation regarding the 2020 Special Olympics Spring Games, and I invite Inspector Mark Kroll and Cooper Moore up to the podium. Welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Mayor Jaworski and members of council. Thanks so much for the, the kind invitation. Is the audio okay? Uh, very pleased to be here. My name is Inspector Mark Kroll. I'm here on behalf of Chief Brian Larkin, and thank you so much for uh, this wonderful opportunity to showcase uh, the Waterloo Region's hosting of the 2020 Special Olympics Ontario Spring Games. This is a fantastic opportunity for our entire region, and particularly the city of Waterloo, uh, to embark on this incredible journey of bringing athleticism, recreation, and celebration on a number of levels. And although I'm providing the bulk of the delegation today. Uh, we have a very inspiring uh, address at, at some point. So our, our Waterloo region is hosting the games and this will bring in not only economic benefits uh, to the city and our region, but we'll be hosting uh, about 2,500 plus people uh, in between May 21st and May 23rd of 2020. This will bring 635 athletes, or more than 150 coaches, over 400 families and supporters, and over 500 volunteers bring people together, primarily within the city of Waterloo. Uh, some events will be held in Kitchener as well, but bringing people together not only to promote uh, recreation, athleticism, but to bring a spirit of excitement, uh, volunteerism, and really a celebration of the human spirit. So for those of you who don't know, the worldwide movement of the Special Olympics that's been around for several decades, this initiative seeks to promote uh, empowerment, uh, excellence in sport and uh, really community connections, a respect, a celebration of diversity and also a sense of inclusion. And the vision here is that we're coming together as a community to provide a, a sense of, of belonging for everybody and really just have some fantastic fun together. And our uh, police service, the Waterloo Regional Police are very happy to serve as uh, the ambassadors and key organizers for this event, but it truly is a, a community collaborative effort to bring things together. So we do have a very short one minute video that just speaks to the spirit of the games and the spirit of where we're heading uh, in, as we approach this uh, fantastic event. The right to play on any playing field, you have earned it. The right to hold a job, you have earned it. The right to study in any school, you have earned it. The right to be anyone's neighbor, you have earned it. You have taught us that what matters is not power or politics, weapons or wealth. What truly counts is the courageous spirit and the generous heart. The days of separation and segregation are over. So 
So you can see there by the uh, fantastic video that the, the spirit here is one of uh, inclusion revolution. And uh, this is a fantastic opportunity for the city of Waterloo uh, to be featured uh, prominently uh, in, this, in this adventure uh, that we embark together. So we have made a formal request that's included in the, in the delegation package in terms of a request for the City of Waterloo to serve as a full partner and local sponsor for the events. This will include a rental uh, facility fee of about $32,000 estimated for the use of the uh, Waterloo Memorial Recreation Complex. And we're also making equivalent uh, requests not only of other municipalities, uh, local uh, educational facilities and so on, but also embarking into private sector requests as well. To give you a sense of what this is going to look like and how fantastic it's going to be, we're embarking upon hosting five key sports, rhythmic gymnastics, powerlifting, basketball, 10-pin bowling, and aquatics. And to give you a sense of uh, the cohesiveness of how this will come together, it really is unique. Uh, other uh, municipalities that have taken on hosting of the games have been sort of spread out and uh, at the at the... Uh, the benefit of only recreational facilities, but hosting this with the City of Waterloo and especially with uh, Wilfrid Laurier University as a key partner will allow us to come together as one uh, sort of uh, community village. So the uh, rhythmic gymnastics will be held at the Waterloo Rec Complex. Powerlifting will be held nearby at the uh, Wilfrid Laurier University Stadium Gym. Basketball will be co-hosted at the uh, Laurier Athletic Complex as well as St. David Catholic Secondary School. Tenpin bowling will be held at uh, the Kingpin Bowl Lounge at Bingaman Center. And the aquatics event will also be held at Wilfrid Laurier University. So you can get a sense of how cohesive this will be in terms of travel, bringing people together and uh, keeping people together. The Athletes Village will be held on the main campus of Wilfrid Laurier University. And the key parts are hosting both the opening and closing ceremonies that will be held at the Waterloo Memorial Complex. We're very pleased that this has all come together and the planning uh, and the heavy lifting continues. So you've heard enough from me. I now want to have uh, Cooper Moore come forward to feature a, a few words about what uh, the hosting of uh, this will mean for the 2020 Spring Games and just what it means for him to be a special athlete. So Cooper Moore. <clears throat> Thanks, Mark. What he said, my name is Cooper Moore. I'm the athlete with the Special Olympics. I'm participating in, in the 2020 Spring Games in the aquatics sector. So... <clears throat> Hearing that I made it to the provincial swim team was very exciting for my mom and I. She could not stop jumping up and down for joy. I know that there is nothing stopping me or getting in my way. I'm excited for the, to have the opportunity to compete in, to compete in the spring games, have fun, and try my very best. My parents, brother, are not. My parents and brother are very excited, and they can't wait to cheer me on. Athletes are coming all over Ontario. We want to ensure to so that they have an experience of a lifetime in one of the regions that they will never forget by sponsoring a 2020 athlete uh, an athlete for the 2020 spring provincial games you're providing the opportunities for me and the athletes to make memories that will last in that will last a lifetime so thank you one advance thank you for the information thank you for the invitation invitation for me to come here and speak to you guys and hope to see you all in the stands to cheer the athletes on. Can you stand with me, Cooper? Yep. Okay, just move over a Sound little. Sound Oh, perfect. Okay. So. so thank you, Cooper. So the, the sense of enthusiasm and passion that Cooper has, you can sense that it'll be ripple effect and replicated for every athlete, every family coming to our community. And uh, we thank you for your contributions thus far. We've been promoting this in different ways, and uh, Cooper's been a big part of that along with many others. As I wrap up, uh, we've just launched our uh, Draft an Athlete program, which provides an opportunity for community members, uh, families, uh, agencies, teams of all kinds to uh, get behind the games, to promote uh, the athletes uh, as they're drafted into uh, uh, preparing for the games. And this is something that's being featured in all our promotional material. So in closing, I just want to thank you for this tremendous opportunity uh, that's uh, before you today in terms of... Uh, the, the opportunity for the, not only the City of Waterloo, but to co-host this with many partners that have stepped forward uh, to promote this uh, fantastic event. And I'm very pleased to, uh, to announce that uh, on December 12th, uh, the Waterloo Regional Police Service badging ceremony will, will be hosted at the Laurier's uh, Lazaridis School of Business. And as we welcome 20 new officers forward in the badging ceremony, we'll also be providing a formal announcement. Uh, Mayor Jaworski has been invited to attend. 
and uh, we'll make, be announcing with uh, Deb McClatchy, uh, president of Wilfrid Laurier University, in terms of the, the co-hosting partnership of these games. So subject to any questions or, or dialogue, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Yeah. Thank you both for coming and Cooper, I have to say, I'm originally from Australia and we're really into our aquatics. So I'll be cheering you on too. Um, any questions or comments for the delegates? Um, Mayor Jaworski. Well, thank you through the chair. What a wonderful opportunity to have the Special Olympics come to, uh, to Waterloo Region for, uh, for 2020. You know, we tried to get the, the Children's Summer Games and that didn't work out for us. So I'm even more thrilled to get the uh, Olympics to come here. I don't think we heard a date. Is it August or what's the time frame of this? So it'll be May 21st May. to May 23rd uh, okay. of 2020. Okay, you know, I think uh, I think Cooper, you'll have a special experience here, and just think that's you know hosted right here in Waterloo. I I know uh, Commissioner Mark Dykstra has certainly been uh, working on, on this file for uh, for a few weeks now, and uh, we'll have something figured out in the next couple of weeks for us so that we can come uh, come be a sponsor. I think that's something that will be very exciting for the city of Waterloo and just all the excitement this brings to our area. And special thank you to Chief Larkin, who has put a lot of heart and soul into this for decades and uh, I know it's so near and dear to his heart and uh, for for him and his actions to bring it here through Waterloo Regional Police Service I think it's uh, just does so much uh, for our community so thank you uh, on my behalf. Thank you. Any other okay not seeing any others so I'd like to thank you both very much for coming in and wish you all the best with the games. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Moving ahead, we have our next delegation. And first, there's uh, three delegates who are each coming to discuss related issues. First of all, we have Sylvia Scora. I try to invite you to come up to the, to the microphone. And if you could please state your name and your city of residence, please. Hi, my name is Sylvia Scorch, and I'm a resident of Waterloo. Good afternoon, Council and Mayor Dave. Some of you may remember me from the Council meeting on October the 7th, where David Mosco, Karen Maldonado, and I spoke about the problems that the City of Waterloo is facing in regards to housing, specifically student housing, along with our proposed solutions. After having listened to the feedback from councillors and officials in countless meetings and sleepless nights filled with research and debates, my members and I have updated our proposals and our action plan so that it speaks more to the municipality and acts as a starting point for legislation changes and improvement for the housing situation. Today I will be addressing the issues surrounding student housing in Waterloo and its inevitable impacts on mental health. After that we will have David speak and Kieran. To start off, Waterloo is facing a housing crisis. There is a lack of universally, universally affordable housing. Rent that is $670 per month is considered cheap, and that's if you're lucky enough to find something that cheap. For people on social assistance or even OSAP, a cheap apartment can easily account for more than half of their total income, leaving next to nothing for groceries, transportation, and other needs. Another issue we are addressing is a failure of landlords to provide adequate living conditions. There are students dealing with cockroaches, bed bugs. Rats, don't get me wrong, there are students who, of course, like to party, break the rules, and make a mess. But that stereotype is the exception rather than the norm. We came here from all over the world to learn, not party. Many of us spend all our weekends working hard at our jobs and studying for our futures and are capable enough of maintaining and cleaning our properties. Next, landlords routinely exploit tenants and violate the law without consequence. Key deposits legally can only cover the cost of replacing keys, but routinely act as a damaged deposit. It is one of the most common complaints from tenants in Waterloo, despite being in violation of subsection 134, bracket 1C of the Residential Tenancies Act of 2006. There have been cases where a unit was advertised as available, um, but was not ready for movement at the start of the lease, leaving the prospective person suddenly without housing. Uh, one of our focuses of criticism is that the LTB complaint resolution process is inadequate. Students have a limited budget, and a $50 can make a huge difference as to whether they bother reporting the problem or not. In addition to the fee, the waiting time dissuades many tenants from doing so, and for students, the resolution time can easily ex exceed the duration of their stay. Landlords take advantage of the service gap to dodge responsibility and ignore maintenance requests, even if that means that they're in violation of safety codes, because they know that they'll get away with it. Another factor that prevents students, student tenants from filing a complaint is in the word itself. Students. 
Students are in survival mode. They are more concerned with their studies than with addressing housing issues. Sometimes we have to put our own emotional health to the side, our sanity to the side, our sleep schedules, our own needs to the side, just so that we can be successful in university and catch up with our bills. Some of us don't have the time and energy to deal with things that we shouldn't be dealing with, yet alone individually deal dealing with in the first place. We are seeing more suicides and more alarming cases surrounding mental health. How are we as future leaders even supposed to progress in society if we can't even focus in class at this very moment because we are spending so much time worrying about housing issues? How are we expected to be academically successful if we are spending countless nights doing research and we're up here speaking at council when we should be dealing with other things like studying for a test tomorrow? We just want to learn. The last problem is homelessness. To have hard-working students sleeping in their cars and living on the streets is completely unacceptable. There are only 241 beds available in the region, 46 of which are reserved for youth between the ages of 12 and 25, and this does not remotely meet the needs and demands of not only the homeless population, um, homeless student population, but the homeless population of the region before students are factored in. There are no homeless shelters in the city of Waterloo. We shouldn't go through this. We just want to learn. Since the last council meeting with my group um, on October the 7th, a few students and members from the community, along with myself, have been meeting regularly and have taken many eventful actions. Some of these accomplishments and ongoing actions include, I have helped with the creation of an information packed workshop with general legal information around tenants' rights on November the 12th. Um, my members and I have revised and finalized our, our action plan document. My letter was forwarded by the Office of the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, uh, to Dr. Antoine, Manager of Ministerial Affairs. Uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Gorsh, can I just ask you to slow down a little bit while you're speaking, please? Yes. I really want to be able to hear everything you're saying. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Uh, sorry. Uh, we have teamed up with students from the Geospatial Club at UW and have started to put together a map that shows data on how landlords have been mistreating their tenants. We had a meeting with Jeff Henry and Shane Turner at City Hall where we went over what, the te what their team has done about the issue since our last council meeting on October the 7th and we went over a proposal document. Next up we have David who will go more in depth about the issue. Thank you for your time. Thank you. If you, David, if you wouldn't mind just saying your full name and your city of residence, yeah, please. Uh, absolutely. My name is David Mosco, and I'm a resident of Waterloo. Uh, so just for some context, uh, Sylvia was trying to set the scene for us. Uh, when we did initially sign up for this meeting, we were expecting more individual allotment of time, so she was rushing more as a consequence and function of having to fit in uh, more information you, than you do, you do have individual allotments of time? We do have 10 minutes of time per person. Yep. That's sorry. That's how you're, you're listed. That's why you're listed separately on the agenda here. But that's did, so we, we saw that under one subheading, and I believe there was a miscommunication uh, on our part. So, uh, pardon us in that regard. At any rate, this does give me more time to <laughs> more carefully and deliberately go over my speech. So, all the same, um, pardon us in that regard. So. Sylvia's speech was more a primer, uh, and as mentioned, we are working with members of council presently, um, and we will continue to do so. However, it does still seem prudent to take this time when necessary to maintain the fact that this is a relevant issue. These are pertinent issues, uh, so we will continue to discuss these matters. Uh, with that being said, I will, I suppose, begin my talk now. Um, I'm here to talk today specifically about the urgent need for more care with regards to homeless people in the region of Waterloo. One avenue to help alleviate these social problems is with homeless shelters and social housing. The city of Waterloo, as mentioned, lacks a homeless shelter despite having a population in excess of 110,000, leaving many out to dry. Little data is available the full, about the full, far-reaching extent and scope of homelessness in the Waterloo region. The only information I personally was able to find was a single article mentioning the deaths of seven homeless people in the Waterloo region in the winter of 2011. What we do know is that this situation is not isolated to 2011. There's no reason to believe so. The conditions have not improved since then. Indeed, they've only worsened. While there may not be data available directly about homelessness in Waterloo, we can look to other regions for insight on the matter. Advocates in Toronto, including councillors and members of provincial parliament, have called on Toronto to issue a state of emergency over homelessness after several homeless deaths uh, already in the winter season of this year. Toronto's housing market is certainly in a different league than ours, but the symptoms are the same. Housing prices have been rising in Waterloo, uh, 
pardon me, housing prices have been rising in Waterloo several times at the rate of inflation for years, with the average cost of a Waterloo rental being 20% higher than in 2012. From an average student rental cost of $870 in 2012 to $1,042 in 2017. 63% of homeless Canadians have cited high rent costs as a reason for their homelessness. The material conditions that lead to homelessness are staring us in the face, and it's not even being subtle about it. Homelessness is a systemic problem that's been repeatedly individualized, but whose roots are decidedly systemic. The very fact that Canada has had varying rates of homelessness historically should be proof enough alone of this. The fact that some countries have effectively virtually solved homelessness should be enough to underscore homelessness as a systemic social issue it is. Finland has practically zero homeless people due to their radical and downright common sense approach of giving permanent housing uh, to people as soon as they become homeless. We need policy leaning in that direction. In no uncertain terms, austerity kills. Scrimping and means testing kills citizens. There are people on the streets of this very city right now trying to stay warm that have inadequate shelter to turn to. The UN Commission on Human Rights has guidelines for how prisoners are to be housed, which stipulates housing multiple people to the same area is a last resort that must be done with care and monitoring. Shelters in this sense are quite literally less of a humane place to sleep than prisons, as shelters feature a slew of cots in the same room with no separation or real genuine consideration as to who is sleeping where. Shelters are currently inadequate and inhumane. Not only does Waterloo need one, but we need to develop one that treats people with dignity and care. The main thesis of what I'm saying is that long-term planning needs to happen to capture ways to mitigate homelessness and to accommodate existing homeless. A lot of what I'm discussing is long-term and is meant as a primer for future discussion and policy on the matter. Uh, however, even in short term, I will say that later today, the City of Waterloo Economic Development Strategy for 2019 to 2024 will be presented and discussed. And on this matter, I hope that the recommendations will be considered in such a way so as to not overvalue the success of a dollar figure associated with economic activity uh, at the expense of the less fortunate. The city has already seen enough gentrification at the expense of tenants as is. Thank you for your time. Uh, due to a misunderstanding on our behalf, we did not budget for 10 minutes per person, so we will yield our remaining time. My name is Kieran Maldonado. I am a resident of Waterloo. I am a student at the University of Waterloo, and for the past four months, I've had to constantly worry about finding a place to stay between semesters, the distinct possibility of becoming homeless, my family going nearly bankrupt every month because of how expensive my rent is, and the distinct possibility that I might have to live on the streets because my rent of $670 a month is considered cheap. Since my journey into the personal hell that me and hundreds of other students have had to endure, I've spent as much time as I could into finding solutions, resolving this crisis, not only affecting this town, but the entire region as well. These are my short-term solutions that might not do everything we want long-term, but in the now and in the present can make things a lot better for a lot of people. The first way to partially resolve this issue I would like to talk about is the removal of subsection 2.7c from Municipal Bylaw 2011-047 subsection 2.7c, which would require that all residential buildings with three or more stories be licensed, which would make their landlords be held accountable to a higher standard than the life of career criminals that has become so pervasive in the region. We have discussed this change in the bylaw with Councilman Jeff Henry and Officer of Bylaw Enforcement Shane Turner. And during our meeting, it was determined that this change to the bylaw would require a small force of people to resort the resources needed to start the enforcement of an alleged bylaw change, as well as inspecting the apartment buildings for violations. 
This is the first and easiest request to start the short-term solutions, to create a council committee to investigate the resources required for an amendment to remove subsection 2.7c from Municipal Bylaw 2011-047, which the Ontario Municipal Powers Act of 2001 explicitly enables this town council to do. My second and easiest my second easiest request. I must first state that one of the most prominent criminal activities that the landlords in the region that own the apartment complexes engage in is charging $500 for a key deposit. You can even find that these landlords, such as KW4 Rent and Accommodate You, have this information displayed on their websites. This is admitting to a crime on their own website and encouraging people to pay for that crime. Despite this being in violation of the Landlord-Tenant Act of 2006, subsection 134, subsection 1A, which explicitly states that this is illegal. Even according to the Social Justice Division of Ontario's website, this is again illegal. This is even covered in their question and answer section. Can my landlord charge a key deposit? Yes, but only if the deposit is refundable and the amount of the deposit is not more than the expected cost of replacing the key or keys if they are not returned to the landlord. The landlord must give the deposit back when the tenant turns in their key or keys at the end of their tenancy. With a $500 key deposit, that means that the 10 ounce key would have to be made out of pure solid gold in order to warrant a $500 replacement fee. I can give all the town council members or anyone that requests this a link to the Department of Social Justice of Ontario's website if it would aid in finding the exact bylaw that this is rendered illegal. More interesting is the fact that these key deposits are often deducted from based on damage or allegedly missing furniture in these apartment units, which would mean that the key deposit is a damage deposit, which is also explicitly illegal according to the same Ontario government website. Can the landlord charge the tenant a damage deposit? No, a landlord cannot collect a damage deposit to pay for damage done to the unit. Also, a landlord cannot use the last month's rent to cover damages in the unit. The rent deposit can only be used for last month's rent before the tenancy ends. It goes on to state, if the landlord finds that a tenant has damaged the unit or caused damage to the building, the landlord can give the tenant a notice of termination and slash or ask them to pay for the damages. If the tenant doesn't pay, the landlord can apply to have the LTB determine if there are damages and what should be done about them. Instead, they charge a $500 key deposit and at the end of your lease, deduct from it based on alleged damages incurred. I have multiple friends from across my university to testify that this is what takes place. It is not hard to find any student that has gone through this process and lost a large deal of money as a result of these key deposits, which are in reality damage deposits, both of which are again explicitly illegal under the Landlord-Tenant Act of 2006. My request here is that the Office of Bylaw Enforcement look into this evidence of blatant bylaw violation as soon as possible to bring that those that have forced these deposits upon people to justice. My third and final request regards leniency of the enforcement of regional bylaw 13-050 of the region of Waterloo subsection 2T, which bans the erecting of tents or any other temporary structure without authorization. This impacts the homeless most of all, because during winter break and during the coming winter months, not only will there not be less university buildings available for homeless students to sleep in as they have been for the past three months when they technically shouldn't, 
but the homeless people that are not students in the region will be relying on tent cities to find shelter in them. There is no reason that these innocent people should suffer because they can't find housing that they can afford or housing, period. There is no reason that they should suffer for being poor, as has been the norm for many years. My request here is not only for leniency on the enforcement of subsection 2T of the regional bylaw, but outright authorization of these tent cities as well as protection for these people, as it is well known that certain hate groups attack these tent cities physically because they are normally technically illegal and thus the destruction of these tent cities is, according to them, legal and doing the right thing. Making homeless people suffer because they are poor and trying not to die in the cold is not justice, it is cruelty. My request for the town council regarding this is that there is no more suffering of the people in these tent cities and that they are no longer attacked because they are poor. Don't let an injustice prevail. I yield my time. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for coming and speaking with us today on these very important matters. I'm looking to council to see if there are any questions of the delegates. Uh, Councillor V. Uh, through you, Chair Bonagor, thank you. And thank you all for coming. It's, um, you've brought a lot of things to us. I just, and I didn't catch your first name, the, the last speaker, sorry. Kieran. Hi, oh, sorry. Um, okay, you are on the list. Kieran, have you, I, I was aware of the key deposit issue and I think that's a terrible thing. Has anybody ever, or do you know of anybody that's gone after a landlord to get that money back? I actually do know of quite a few people, like when they try charging them extra for, oh, we're missing a chair, and it ends up being in one of the rooms. I do know of people that have basically gone to the manager to demand that the money goes back, and even then they don't get the entire key deposit back. I know of multiple students that are willing to testify to this if that's what the council asks. Uh, well, I just, I wonder why if students, if you know, and I, I know that because I live, my ward is, there's tons of students and low income housing in my ward. So I know about this and I know that it's a huge issue, but um, if you, if people know about it are they afraid that they're gonna they're gonna get kicked out if they ask for the key deposit back or it's that, is that when they do ask for the key deposit back they either say we'll give it back to you in two weeks and then never do we'll give it back to you in a month and never do or there's various communication between the two groups and they never get the key deposit back in the first place which kw4 rent is particularly guilty of okay so i guess if renters in general, not just students, all renters need to know ahead of time that that's an illegal thing, that they shouldn't, that they're not to pay that much money for a key deposit. So it's education, I guess, in the it end, right? It is not only education that's needed, but enforcement, because these companies know about it. If you mention the bylaw and say that the key deposit is illegal, they'll ask for proof, and when you show them proof, they'll conveniently give it back to you, but... Otherwise, why should they give you the key deposit? They have your money. You're just a regular student. Are you really going to fight someone with lawyers? Okay. Uh, so, Councillor Vasek. Uh, thanks through you, Councillor Bonagor. Thanks all of you for your continued work on this. I was curious, Karen, about one of your um, recommendations, which is the authorization of tent cities. Uh, I'm curious if you're familiar if there are other cities that have authorized it and if there, so are, if there are exemplars that the city of Waterloo could look to. I actually did not get to research any. However, this is what I could come up with given the limited time that I had to definitively look into tent cities. I was given an email... I emailed Kevin Gerlach, who I believe is the city clerk for what bylaw is enforced that this 
that basically bans tent cities. And I was told that Shane Turner's department is the one that covers the enforcement of it. And because he's the officer of bylaw enforcement, he would be the one to actually enforce the removal of tent cities. And I, to answer your question, I do not know of any other town that has enabled tent cities. But all that's needed for them to be allowed is just giving approval to the authorization of these tents. It's not that hard. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, looking for any other comments or questions from council, Mayor Jaworski. Thank you, through the chair. Again, thanks to the students for your enthusiasm of uh, you know looking at this issue, which we all know is a, a serious issue. I think last time we talked, I mentioned about certainly stratifying and separating out all the different issues because you're, there's a lot of the issues there. I would say almost are equivalent in the time that the speakers took, equivalently either provincial responsibility or regional responsibility or then city and other responsibility. And uh, since uh, nobody else here is a regional councillor, I will speak on behalf of the shelter system, which is run by the region of Waterloo, which is across the street, um, that uh, I do know for a fact that last uh, week uh, the youth shelter service, One Roof, was uh, uh, had surplus capacity all last week. We just have happen to have the data for that, so that is certainly available. But uh, I, I did find out that you have to go through the prevention and diversion program criteria of the region of Waterloo. So I don't really know how that works, but that's something that you can certainly refer to other students um, because it de it it def tests for definitive homelessness. So I, I can't really speak further to that, but I do know there was surplus capacity in the system. And uh, it is on the uh, light rail transit system uh, about 15, 17 minutes from the university area. So hopefully that helps. And uh, Councillor Henry. No, no. I'll echo others in, in saying thank you for, for coming forward again. As, as you see from the media table, our media table doesn't normally have people at it. Um, <laughs> this is discouraging to us because we deal with uh, important issues every single time we have a meeting. Uh, but, uh, but it does show that, uh, uh, that folks are, are interested in paying attention uh, to, those, uh, to those items you're raising. And, and that's useful and that's helpful. Uh, as I've said you know, before uh, around this table um, uh, over a, a large number of years, everybody deserves a safe place to live. Uh, and being able to provide that and support that um, recognizing the vast majority of those places are provided by the market and so our tools are sometimes direct and uh, quite often indirect uh, that uh, uh, that we we do appreciate hearing where there are challenges in the in the system and being able to work together to figure out how to plug uh, some of those holes so uh, with that I, I thought I would let uh, uh, let council know um, you know what uh, what the results were of the conversation that uh, that we were able to have with uh, uh, with Shane and, and I and and the group um, uh, the the other week. Uh, I know Shane's off today, um, but I mean, we, we focused the conversation. This conversation, I'm sure there'll be more. We focused this conversation on uh, on that safe you know safe concerns around uh, around housing uh, and and you know those uh, those areas where uh, where folks have found significant deficiencies whether it's mold whether it's heating units whether it's those substantive you know property standards concerns that uh, that nobody deserves to have to face in their uh, in their housing and home uh, and around those we, we had a few uh, a few areas that, uh, that we agreed uh, we would work on and, and move forward with the first was on education uh, I, I know council's aware since mr. Turner's uh, you know, let us know um, staff had looked at um, those same buildings that were subject of the data leak where there were thousands of, uh, uh, of issues uh, and over the same time period uh, staff had received 13 complaints. So that identifies the, the wide gulf between you know, complaints that landlords were receiving and may or may not have been dealing with in an appropriate way. Some yes, some probably not, uh, and some definitely not. Uh, and and that, that shows that you know, tenants, student tenants in, in particular perhaps, but tenants in general, don't know that one of the places they can go when they don't uh, uh, when they don't hear back from their landlord and don't uh, don't get the proper responses they can call the city uh, and we do have uh, an ability to go out and enforce to to inspect and to issue orders and the response that people can get from that and the resolution people can get from that is massively faster 
than the landlord tenant board, which is just plagued by uh, by delays and an inability to enforce its own orders. So uh, we've agreed to, to work together to help promote as much information as we can on how uh, tenants can can leverage our, our staff in that. And there were a few other ideas that that we shared that I think need to be you know discussed and looked into a bit more on on other tactics that we can use to help push the message further than we already have. Um, and. The other area that uh, that we knew uh, that we have a strong agreement on, you've heard some points today from uh, uh, from from the delegates in, in various ways, is advocating for change at the provincial level. Uh, the Residential Tenancies Act is a problem in many ways. The Landlord Tenant Board's ability to enforce that act successfully and enforce its own orders at all uh, is woefully inadequate and needs a, needs a lot of work. We've heard uh, that the province is interested in looking at the Residential Tenancies Act. I'm not sure whether that will be a good or bad thing, um, but uh, it's an opportunity regardless. Uh, and so we've agreed that advocating for provincial change is something we can work on uh, together. I've been working with staff on on highlighting some particular areas, and I've got a couple of updates to make based on last week's meeting to uh, to make sure that we're, we've got alignment on the asks and the suggestions. Uh, and I've got some more from, from our staff that haven't been raised here, but we, we know our issues as well that, that we find. Uh, in the RTA that we can we can work on, uh, and the other one that I know, you know Mr. Turner's taken away to take a look at uh, is the idea of proactive enforcement and what more we can do with that, uh, in the sense that you know we we need to build strong working relationships to have effective and timely action uh, for those kinds of things, and so he's taken back uh, thinking about how they can do that effectively, uh, and I'm sure we'll hear more information from from Shane as he uh, uh, as he as he deals with that operational matter. Um, Fourth is 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 a support for for tenant associations and groups to the extent that that they're acting like neighborhood associations, bringing people together, fostering a sense of cohesion and belonging. I know we've got a subgroup on town and gown that's uh, actively working on on those files, and we might see some stuff uh, uh, out of there. But uh, but there are likely some neighborhood strategy support elements. Um, that we might be able to bring to bear for, for groups that have organized or are trying to organize uh, a tenants association for the purpose of bringing people together and, and finding some cohesion and belonging. Those are areas that are strongly in alignment with the uh, city's strategic plan and our existing plans and resources. And finally, continued dialogue uh, and discussions. We, we had only so much time uh, together uh, last time, and so as I said, it was, it was focused on the, on the maintenance concerns and the ideas around safe housing. There are other concerns that were raised. Uh, and I'd say that, as, as the mayor had done, you know, now I, I also raised that you know, on questions around you know, social housing and, uh, uh, and and homelessness supports. Uh, uh, the folks across the street know a heck of a lot more about that and are are responsible uh, uh, for uh, for those matters. And it's worth having conversations with. You know, the mayor's had some you know, preliminary pieces, but uh, Councillor Strickland and Herb, I'm sure, should be should be hearing about these so that. Uh, uh, that our, our voices at regional council are well aware of of areas within their jurisdiction that uh, that that conversation should continue as well. So, as an update to council, that's where uh, that's where we got to, and I know there's more to do. Excellent, and I would like to again thank all of the delegates for coming in, and I encourage you to keep the conversation going and continue um, with working to advocate for yourselves. That's great. Thank you. Okay, moving on, we have no presentations listed and no consent motions, so we're heading straight into the staff reports. The first is the technical amendment to the boundary map in the McGregor Albert Heritage Conservation District Plan. Uh, we have staff here in case there are any questions. I'm looking around the horseshoe. No? Right. Would someone like to move this, that this report be accepted and approved? Councillor Vasek and Councillor Henry, all in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, that was to staff, not to you. <laughs> uh, next, we have the revised municipal alcohol policy 2019. Um, we do have staff available for questions, and um, Beth, I'll just. Wondering if you had some uh, initial remarks to get. I, know, I understand there's not a presentation, but if there's initial remarks, that would be great. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to issue a point of clarification. On uh, page 27 of the council packet, under additional considerations, the third bullet point 
states that the provincial government has proposed an additional legislative change, which would allow municipalities to designate public areas such as parks. Sorry, for the consumption of alcohol. Um, we have recently found out that, in fact, this legislation has been passed, and so that obviously impacts this particular paragraph. Um, we just wanted to clarify that this particular point of the legislation doesn't impact the revisions we have brought forward today. Um, it's something which will have to be explored more uh, at a later time. We don't have a lot of information at this point, but um, in terms of what we're revising, that particular point of the legislation doesn't have a bearing on that. All right, we've got some, any questions for staff? We've got Councillor Vies. Thank you, through you, Chair Bonagor. Um, I just want to make, I, I was interested in the third party catering endorsements and SOPs um, as for Moses Springer. And it, I don't know what page that was on. I just printed it out. Um, 27, maybe? So does that, uh, does a third party catering endorsement, that means, is that any restaurant outside of the city that now that wants, that would want to have a, an event or um, some kind of a party there would not be allowed to do that? The, through you, um, Chair, the, that change would mean that, um, yes, only the only, I'll, Alcohol could only be served through our food services um, team and their catering endorsement at Moses Springer. Um, that has been the case already at Albert McCormick. Um, and so we're aligning those two, we're proposing to align those two facilities. Okay, so, so only uh, back to the food. So if a, um, so an individual wanted to have, no, no cater, like they can't have another, a restaurant cater in any of our facilities through you chair this is not about food service only no. alcohol service so they couldn't bring in another organization to provide alcohol service alcohol service could only be through our food services team and their catering endorsement okay. um, but they could someone having an event with food could hire other uh, catering companies oh what I see Steve moving to the chair now. <laughs> That's um, okay, thank you. And just one more. I was reading about um, only using soft plastic cups in our facilities, and that um, that to me is not a sustainable practice. Is that something that we are we have to stick with, or is that something we can um, change? I don't know. I just see that that's not a. If, if we're in a climate emergency here, then. Uh, those kind of things should be uh, rethought, in my opinion. Through your chair, uh, yes, absolutely. I just want to point out that that's um, intended to be a guideline. Um, in that point of the policy, it's really to uh, ensure that that materials such as glass, which can pose a safety hazard if they are used, um, are not brought into the events. But other materials such as uh, paper or any other more sustainable material, material could be used and, and probably would be allowed. It's meant to be a guideline. It's not a hard set that you must use plastic. Uh, Councillor Henma. Thank you, uh, Councillor Rod. Want to go through you. Um, Nadia, could you elaborate a little bit more on what um, other munis municipalities are considering. You made reference to there being some proposed changes coming through, and I'm just thinking of larger events or larger activities that might involve a number of um, facilities that are both within the City of Waterloo and outside. So I'm just curious what some of the other uh, municipalities are considering, and are we going to be in alignment? Through you, Chair. Um at the moment, uh, we're not too clear on exactly where other municipalities in the region will go. Um, we believe that Kitchener will be bringing forth changes to their policy in the new year. However, I can't speak to exactly where they will stand on these revisions that we're proposing. Um, you may have seen that Wilmont had brought their, or attempted to bring their policy forward um, recently. Um, I'm, and as for other municipalities in the region, I can't speak to that at this time. Just looking around, any other comments or questions from Council? Okay, look, do I have a mover? 
Okay, um, Mayor Jaworski. Yeah, I think moving it with respect to uh, Nadia's commentary, and I know Councillor Bonagard spotted it as well, that uh, the, the commentary on the provincial government, uh, now that we have firm legislation, to ignore that aspect of the, uh, uh, the report. So to accept the report, but ignoring the part that uh, speaks to future law, which is now a current law, and we can look at that at a, at a different time. Uh, second, Councillor Henry. Uh, I'll call the vote. Everyone in favour? Okay, that's everyone. Thank you. And next we have the strategic plan implementation update and I believe we have a presentation from Anna Marie Cipriani. So welcome to the podium. <laughs> Alrighty, good afternoon. So I'm here to, to provide some brief context, further context, I think, and to highlight uh, some of the components that are already discussed in uh, the report that you have in your packets today. So indeed, we have created and approved a strategic plan. We have communicated on this strategy. And where we're at right now is that across the organization, we are aligning to this new strategic plan. So in particular, the processes that involve the budget and business plans are underway, and that alignment is also underway. Furthermore, something that I'm involved in and many others are starting to be involved in, in is developing a more robust way of measuring progress and about our implementation of the strategic plan that will help us to communicate and uh, continue to engage on this work. So in that way, we are seeking to develop a performance management system. So what's happening? There are several components uh, that are already in place and that will uh, really help us to develop a suite of indicators that we can be proud of that speak to our municipality and our local context and the work that we're engaging in. So the first part in our business plans, I want to be clear about what you can expect in these business plans as they come forward. And there's two things I really want to highlight for you. So firstly, in those business plans, we will identify specific initiatives that align with the strategic plan. And we will also identify primarily output measures specific to those ident identified initiatives. And many of you will also be familiar with our strategic plan progress updates. Those updates uh, have traditionally happened in the fall, and we anticipate that those will continue in the fall of 2020, 21, and 22. So those updates specifically speak to projects and initiatives that are in the business plan and to progress along that work, and we anticipate that will continue. So when we look at building a performance management system and building it out a bit, there are a few things that we look to. We look to emerging frameworks and also to existing frameworks. So I want to speak to two emerging frameworks. So you'll be familiar to some extent with both of these frameworks. The first one is ISO 37120, and it specifically speaks to uh, municipalities and sustainability. It is an international standard. So we anticipate that in the first quarter of 2020, we will have reported into the framework and will be certified. So that work is underway now across the organization and across the different levels of, um, you know, for instance, government, whether it be provincial or federal. So all the different parties that will support this reporting, it's underway. The Sustainable Development Goals is another framework that we are engaging in. This framework at a municipal level is not as mature and ready to roll. It is um, a successful framework at an international level, but at a subnational level, it is not um, very mature yet. And so the work that's going to come through the local voluntary review and some work that we're doing ourselves in house will help to improve the ability of municipalities and in particular ourselves to be able to report into this framework and to utilizing it to help us better understand our progress. So while I've discussed briefly two emerging frameworks, we have several existing frameworks that as a municipality we report into. And I'd like to walk us through kind of just an overview of some of the reporting that happens already. 
So we have legislated reporting. Some of those are, will be through the Building Code or the Electricity Act, uh, the Drinking Water Systems Act, or the Financial Information Return. Other reporting we do might speak to targets and performance measures that are set for us. So be that through the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing or through the LIN, the Local Health Integration Network. We have other voluntary frameworks that we are engaged in. So for instance, the National Water and Wastewater Benchmarking Initiative, the Wellbeing Waterloo Region survey work we've recently done, and Regional Sustainability Initiative, an initiative that we report into yearly. We also have online platforms. So when, for instance, citizens engage in uh, services that we offer uh, through ActiveNet, Pickup Hub, or Engage Waterloo as examples, we also have data uh, and, and entry into data points through those platforms. <coughs> In-house, we have electronic management systems such as Amanda, Maximo, PeopleSoft, and GIS. These are also areas where we begin to look to see, you know, all these ways that we um, have data and access to data about our organization and our community. We do conduct program evaluations across the organization for many of our programs. So as examples, our museums run evaluations, health and safety, there are quarterly reports, and municipal enforcement has their own. At a real operational level, we have many assets and we inspect those assets regularly. So some of those assets will be playgrounds, trees, turf, outdoor rinks. So all of these existing frameworks are areas where we report regularly and they also potentially provide opportunities to find the right suite of indicators that work for our organization to create a much more holistic, robust picture of our organization, the services we deliver, and our community. And why we would want to do that is because I think having a, a holistic corporate ref reporting framework that reflects our organization is, uh, is useful. And it, I think, will be a play, a, a play of looking at existing frameworks uh, and emerging frameworks. And also looking outside of those frameworks for data that works to help us uh, have informed decision making. And so really focusing on evidence-based decision making. Also, data helps us communicate. It helps us engage the right people to move forward and also enables us to be more accountable. So this work, this type of reporting, I think will also help us to further define end states. So what does success look like on any one of the pillars and in all of those objectives that we've identified in our strategic plan? So to sum up, these are just a few highlights of where we are at in implementing the strategic plan and what we are looking towards doing uh, with reporting with regards to the implementation of the STRAP plan in progress. And I hope that gives you a sense of where we're at and, and what's next. I'm happy to uh, entertain any questions. Thank you for the update. I'm looking around to see if there are questions from Council. Councillor Hanma, you're first up. <coughs> Thank you very much, Chair, through, uh, through you. Um, thank you, Anne-Marie, Anne -Marie, for the update. It's always good to know where we're, where we're heading and what kind of information will be coming forward. In terms of uh, reporting, I'm always very interested in the qualitative versus the quantitative um, data. And it's, it's very, very easy to get the output kind of data, uh, how many times we're doing something or how many people participated in something. What I'm really interested in, though, is how we're going to be able to, or what your thoughts are around the outcomes. So what's the difference we're making with some of these projects, and how are we going to be measuring that? I know it's no small task, but I think that's an important area for us to begin working toward. So the way that I orient to outputs and outcomes really is, is how much and how well. And the how well aspect is really the part of evolution of this work. And so I think, you know, as a, as a team of staff that are starting to look at this work, I think we'll take that into consideration. We're also happy to, to hear if there are examples of what you're finding your counterparts is finding useful mm -hmm. to, uh, to the work because the how well is a bit more of that storyline. It's a bit more about defining those end states. And I think that the work about defining those end states is, is something we need to, to move forward. Mm -hmm. So if there's anything you wish to offer uh, in terms of you know, your experience that you've seen as being useful, I'm, hap I'm happy to hear uh, about those aspects. 
Great. We'll certainly continue the dialogue uh, for sure. And what I'm encouraged by is that there is consideration to look at the what I usually refer to the softer side of it. So what's the difference that we're actually making? Some of the things won't lend themselves to that at all. But if we can be mindful of that as we look at the indicators that we're going to be putting forward, what's it really telling us and what difference is it making? Thank you. Thanks. Right, Councillor Bodley. Thank you, uh, through Chair Bonagor. Uh, thanks for all the work that you're doing on this. I know that uh, as a council liaison to the Sustainable Advisory Committee and as a staff liaison to the Sustainable Advisory Committee, I know this is a big thing, the ISO uh, 37120 connectivity to the strap plan. Uh, and so really pleased to see that we're, we're making some progress uh, on that. Uh, it's really exciting. And I just, I, I kind of just wanted to highlight um, and connect the dots to our earlier delegations here. Some of the some of the data that we're looking to to get, whether with respect to housing and with respect to population and social conditions. So we're looking at gathering data on the percentage of people living in affordable housing, the percentage of the city population living in inadequate housing, the number of homeless per hundred thousand, uh, percentage of people living below the national poverty line, etc. So, the for for me personally, I'm I'm a big data guy and. So having this data to help us inform decisions about what we're going to be doing to tackle these problems is extraordinarily important. Uh, and so I think it's very timely that we're, we're seeing this uh, today, given the delegations that came forward. And again, I just want to thank you for, for all the work that you've done so far on this issue. Looking around, any further questions or comments? No, I'm going to throw mine in then uh, for you, Anna Marie. So. When I was looking through the report, um, one of the goals stood out for me, and it was the governance goal for women as a percentage of elected officials. Uh, and looking around this horseshoe, I think right now we're doing okay. Um, doesn't say well, it'll always be that way, but I think it's quite good. But I'm just curious, um, is there a way that we could also report on a similar kind of thing when we're looking at the leadership mix across the organization itself? Sure. So I think when we look at any indicator, I think there's going to be a few things um, that we assess in terms of is such an indicator of value, and if so, to whom and how and in what way. So a couple things would be, you know, one is the data available. Two, you know, does it align with our strategic plan? Is it something we already, uh, you know, are reporting on? And so when I look to, you know, the that indicator that you have in mind, it is a, a really apt extension, perhaps of of the ISO framework uh, that we are currently reporting into and uh, it does speak to I'd say our strategic plan and the pillar of equity inclusion and sense of belonging and particularly to objective number one so my sense is it's something I think we could take back and as leadership you know reflect on and, and assess is is there opportunity to uh, to have that as as part of you know how we look at our organization and, and assess how we do reflect the community for instance so thanks for that that would be appreciated. Thank you. Um, on that note, do I have looking for someone to move? Councillor Bodley, a second Councillor Henry. I'll call the vote. Those in favour of receiving this? That's everyone. Thank you. And our next. Uh, Next report that's coming up is the City of Waterloo Economic Development Strategy for 2019 to 2024. And we have uh, Justin McFadden coming up to speak with us. Welcome, Justin. Okay, thank you. I feel like I'm on an episode of Between Two Ferns here with all the <laughs> poinsettias. Um, so I'm uh, going to kick things a long time coming. It's been about a, been about a year of, of work. Um, and uh, what we're going to do today, I'm going to quickly introduce Trudy Parsons, who I think is a familiar face for Council. Uh, she was our consultant on the project, and Trudy's going to walk us through kind of the process that led us to today. And then we'll jump into a high-level overview of, of the strategy and then, and then take some questions. Thanks very much, Justin. Good afternoon, everyone. 
So for uh, a, a few minutes, um, I'm just going to speak primarily to the project overview and then Justin will do the actual presentation of the strategy and of course happy to answer any questions upon completion. Uh, so similar to the uh, corporate strategic plan, we had created a phased approach uh, to uh, develop the economic development strategy, primarily looking at where is it that we are now, so what is our current situation, understanding the direction um, and the ability to move forward, so where is it we want to go, and then of course creating a strategy that is actually going to guide the direction to move us uh, to that desired state. There were several um, forms in which were uh, utilized to gather the information. Um, you know, certainly, of course, there's always secondary research, which you see primarily outlined there in phase one. In phase two, because this uh, project was happening simultaneously to the corporate strategic plan, uh, we actually worked together with uh, the corporate strategic plan team as well as the economic development team um, and combined some of the questions in the interview process so that we were actually able to utilize individual time um, you know, through one interview versus having to reach out twice to, uh, to many of the same people. And so that really helped to support those one-on-one -on -one conversations to get some insight and perspectives from uh, those that were being targeted for those interviews. Of course, there is an economic development committee which was involved throughout the process, and we had the opportunity to present and have dialogue and discussion with that group as well. One of the things specifically that I wanted to showcase uh, during the presentation was the aspirations that emerged through our SOAR assessment. So again, Council would be familiar with SOAR in, in comparison to SWOT. So really, uh, you know, looking at what are the uh, aspirations, uh, what are the risks, and what are the results. So there were a number of other pieces to this, but specifically wanted to draw your attention to the aspirations that were identified um, as we engaged in the dialogue and conversations. And you can see that there are six here that really uh, came out strongly from the dialogue and from the research. And so what we did was we wanted to apply... Oh, that slide's missing, sorry. So what we did was we wanted to look at... Um, you know, what were the, the core elements that were important uh, from an economic development strategy perspective that individuals and organizations that we had spoken to really wanted to make sure that we reflected in the strategy. And again, as you can see, you know, the use of innovation was very important, recognizing the importance of the interconnect interconnectedness between workforce development and economic development and having the availability of that talent to support the strategy and the, uh, the business development resulting from from that, recognizing the importance of a diversified economy, not having our eggs all in one basket, uh, looking at the attractiveness of the city as a core indicator to be able to attract talent and to keep talent and businesses in the area, making sure that we had a supportive system and an ecosystem in place that actually promoted um, business development and business investment and attraction. And as we heard through presentations today, the importance of the availability of housing um, as, a, as a key element to uh, economic development. So on that note, I will pass it over to Justin. And of course, as I said, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I think your slide was this one. Oh, it went, it moved. <laughs> it OK, reversed. that's fine. OK. Yeah, no worries. All right, thanks. Um, OK, so, uh, so we'll kind of go through the strategy fairly quickly here. I think I've got six minutes on the timer. Um, so we have uh, three strategic goals, nine strategic objectives, 27 targeted actions within those objectives, and 56 activities that complement those targeted actions. So there's a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of stuff in here. Uh, we'll go through them one by one. So uh, strategic goal number one is uh, to start and attract. Uh, so a few few pieces here. So obviously, what we're trying to do is is uh, encourage the the starting of new businesses and, 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 and attracting new ones. Objective number one, enhance startup and emerging arts and culture industry support. So really what we're trying to do here is change the lens with respect to how arts and culture is viewed in the community. Um, 
it's, it's really, I think, traditionally been viewed as something that you experience. And what we're trying to do is, is have this now be viewed going forward as an industry in and of itself, an industry with, with real jobs, real career opportunities, and invested in like any other uh, sector that we have here in, in the region. So, so that's really what those uh, pieces are, are there to, to try and achieve, uh, encourage the development of arts incubator hubs. We've made similar investments in, uh, in tech hubs in, in the region and, uh, and the like. So, uh, so that's kind of the focus of objective number one. Objective number two, enhance advanced investment attraction through targeted uh, outreach. So um, there's uh, the Waterloo Economic Development Corp traditionally focuses on FDI, so that outreach to new investment from outside the region. Uh, so we're playing a supportive role in that. And then looking at a couple of other areas where we can take a leadership role. And so uh, two of those that we've targeted would be focusing on social enterprises and nonprofits. If you look at the region, it is kind of a strength that we have quite a number of, of strong uh, nonprofits here in the region, CG, um, uh, Perimeter, and others of different, or of, of different scales. So, so perhaps a, a bit of a focus on that, uh, as well as uh, a focus on attraction of uh, film and television media content development. So this is a little different than what you would see in Cambridge where their focus is on uh, you know, film shoots and, and, and production. This would really be a focus on you know, leveraging those technology uh, resources that we have here in post-production, animation, uh, digital content development, those sorts of things. <clears throat> Objective number three, strategic priority number one, improve investment readiness. So, Continued development of city-owned lands, so a lot of work on the west side employment lands. Uh, I know Council is very familiar with, with the work that we're doing there and that Sandy's leading on that project. Uh, we have hit some pretty, pretty good milestones on that recently, so uh, we're, we're definitely moving in the, in the right direction and we'll be looking to uh, be able to start marketing those lands later this year. Uh, looking at uptown development, uh, uptown land city, the city of Waterloo has uh, 15 plus properties in uptown that are ripe for different types of uses, but certainly employment being a key one and, and part of the reason why we're taking uh, the lead on that. And then build an inventory of resources to encourage investment and support uh, invest, investment opportunities as, as we go forward. Objective number four, support strategic talent attraction. So again, taking a bit of a more supportive role. Some of these initiatives were taking leadership, others were taking a more of a supportive role. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, talent attraction related initiatives happening region wide. I won't go into all of them here, but certainly we wanna make sure that that's important, an important thing we focus on and, and we, we support all of those initiatives that are happening region wide on, on talent attraction. <clears throat> Strategic priority number two, preserve and grow. Uh, so keeping what we have and making sure that it continues to, to grow and expand. Uh, so really taking a, a, a big focus on BR&E. So uh, it's something that we have done in the past, but we really want to focus our efforts on a, on a real program around business retention and expansion. We really want to go out and, and understand from the community in a very targeted, systematic way, um, you know, what are some of the issues that companies are having here and how do we action uh, to help solve those issues. So that's, that's really what objective number five is focused on. Objective number six, enhanced development of creative spaces. Um, so this uh, partially supports objective number one, which is focusing on uh, enhancing you know, uh, how we view uh, culture as an industry. Uh, so so in, uh, focusing on investment for uh, new, new exhibition space, making sure that the arts and culture industry uh, has those spaces available. Sometimes they don't have uh, necessarily the, the amount of funding that other organizations would have. So making sure that the development community, for example, understands the value of supporting these types of spaces and how it can impact the rest of their, their business. So, so a lot of advocacy work uh, on that. Also the MAT funding will come into play quite a bit on objective number six, especially as we increase investment in cultural and sport uh, tourism, <clears throat> as well as increased capital for uh, arts and uh, culture industries. Strategic priority number three, organize and empower. This is where we're really trying to take a leadership position uh, in the community and encourage a bunch of different things to happen. So objective number seven, encourage increased diversity in local industries. Um, so, you know, supporting those networking opportunities, we were targeting women in creative industries. One of the areas that we see us taking a, a bit of an underlying focus 
uh, would be in supporting uh, you know STEAM initiatives for for kids. So if you look at what's HIP, what HIP is doing in partnership with the University of Waterloo. Um, um, uh, s supporting those types of initiatives to, you know, encourage, uh, you know, uh, women in STEAM and, and girls as well. Uh, support partner initiatives that promote diversity and inclusion. So as part of our BRE efforts, for example, uh, taking what we learn and, and know, and obviously there's a big focus on diversity and inclusion here at the city. I think I would argue we're on the forefront of that, uh, and and really taking those learnings and and, and making sure that. Uh, companies in Waterloo are also following suit in that regard. So uh, I think that's something that we can take a leadership role in. Showcase that Waterloo is a complete community. This is really about marketing the city and making sure that uh, you know the right messaging is, is out there about uh, you know what's happening here and all the exciting things and to encourage that type of investment that we want to see. Uh, also supporting the, Tr the Toronto Waterloo Region Corridor Initiative. Uh, this is one of the key pieces of talent attraction, one of the key issues that, that we're seeing and, and one of the last pieces. I know that, that the Metrolinx has spoken recently about some progress that they have made on their business plan looking forward to 2025, but we still want to keep focused on that to make sure a lot of, a lot of work has gone into that to get us to this point. We want to make sure that that is uh, seen through to 2025. Uh, and final, finally, uh, enhance quality of life and quality of place. Um, advocate for diversified housing options. I think this is probably uh, perhaps breaking a little bit of ground on the on the economic development side of things, but it really ties into, um, from our perspective, one of the ways it ties in at least is making sure that uh, you know companies here have a full range of talent that they can have access to. Uh, if people can't live here, they can't work here, and so. Um, that's, that's certainly one of the lenses that we're using as we focus on diversified housing options and some work in our department has already begun uh, in that regard. And then uh, leveraging incentive programs federally, uh, provincially, making sure that companies here are, are aware of that. Um, so that's kind of the highlighted quick, I'm 44 seconds over, so I think we did okay. Um, any questions that you have for myself, Trudy, or perhaps even some members of the ECDEV team? I think Folks here. You just stole my line. Any questions from council? Just kidding. <laughs> Any questions from uh, from council to staff? Uh, Councillor Hammer. Thank you, uh, Chair Bonagor. Through you, um, thank you for the update, both of both of you, on where things are at with the economic development strategy. I'm curious about the. Um, it's with strategic priority number one, and specifically looking at increasing the number of not for profits and social enter enter enterprises. And I wondered if you've given any thought to looking at those for profits that are considering becoming B corps or or the existing not-for-profits that are currently looking at yeah. um, a for-profit arm or, a, or an arm that's going to have them going in a diversified revenue stream and how those would be captured or are they yeah. going to be captured? Um, I would say that at this stage of the game, it's, it's one of those items on the list that we're very much at the beginning stages of. So mm -hmm. we haven't evolved into, um, you know, in certain terms of targeting which uh, organizations we will target, uh, you know, creating a focus list. Um, that sort of thing. So that type of input would actually be kind of kind of interesting. I don't think that we were using that particular lens in terms of companies that are looking to transition from one to another. Um, so that's uh, maybe we can chat a little bit offline about that because uh, I know you've got some some interesting background in that area. So I, I would be interested in furthering it. And it's not so much the companies transitioning to it; it's considering another diverse uh, another revenue stream. So right. establishing something in it, I would hate for that to be lost in mm -hmm. our numbers. It's not net new companies, but it's a net new um, innovation or innovative way that they're looking right. at bringing revenue and jobs and everything else into the yeah. community. So, thank you. Uh, Councillor Bodley. Thank you. Uh, through you, Chair Bonagor. Um, I had a couple of questions. One was around uh, in the in the risk section of the report, uh, there was a comment around complacency of the City of Waterloo and concern that we are taking our uh, uh, success from an economic development perspective for granted. And I'm wondering whether you could speak to that, whether you have any comments about what we're doing or not doing that may be leading to that complacency risk, at least from a perception perspective. Yeah, I, I can, uh, so uh, through you, through your Chair Bonagor, to, 
to you, Chair, uh, to you, Councillor Bon uh, Bodily. Um, so, in terms of, uh, sorry, your question was about complacency. complacency, right? Yeah. So, so certainly that would have been part of the feedback that came through some of our different sessions. Um, I think uh, I think that that was certainly uh, when I started in the role about six years ago. That was um, that was I think something that was pointed to for some of some things that had happened in the past. Um, I don't really, you know, being in the role, I mean, I don't really feel like we're being complacent as a, as a municipality or certainly as, as a city or a region, whether it be citywide or with, uh, if you look at all the different individuals that we have here, in fact, I think that we're probably one of the most proactive regions that uh, I've had the, you know, I, I've experienced and I've lived in other places. Um, the community here is very engaged. I don't think you'll find another community that's very engaged, much more engaged on the economic development front. Um, we are sort of one cog in many wheels uh, that we support here. So um, I know it was it was a comment that, that kind of came in through them. We so we, we make sure we account for and and uh, make sure all of the feedback, or at least a summary of all the feedback, is is uh, included in the in the report. But uh, uh, it's something that obviously you always want to make sure you're not being uh, complacent, but it's not something that I feel like this community sort of is. <clears throat> That's good. Thank you. <laughs> um, and a second question. So uh, in the in the strap plan, in a number of uh, locations, it talks about intervention or investment, and we're talking about really funding and uh, choosing where we're going to to spend some of our economic development dollars. Mm -hmm. And I know that we get. Uh, a lot of requests uh, for funding from a from a whole host of different groups, yeah. and I'm wondering if we have sort of a uh, an assessment tool because sometimes those requests are pretty small, and I know uh, at ActDev uh, at the committee uh, they're small. We discuss them, and even part of the conversation is, well, it's only it's only ten thousand yeah. um, dollars, or uh, you know, it's not it's it's not a big investment, and and we think we think that we're going to get a return on it. But sometimes we're getting requests that are significantly more than than that. And I'm wondering if we have some sort of a tool within the economic development uh, group that allows us to assess when these funding requests are coming forward, mm -hmm. whether or not they're aligned with our economic de development strategy, whether they're aligned with our broader strategic plan, and yeah. some way of giving sort of a scorecard to that, because it seems like we are a little maybe reactive uh, in, in that we're accepting sort of requests and hearing what people have to say as yeah. opposed to going out there when it talks about investment or intervention. Yeah, I think when you when uh, when you when it's known that you may have some money to invest, it's pretty it's pretty uh, easy to be reactive. Uh, they, they, the opportunities kind of find their way to your door. Um, we, we don't have a formal tool, but part of the reason why we wanted to uh, get this economic development strategy done was so that we could, um, you know, put everything through the lens of, of the economic development strategy. So to ensure that we're, you know, we're, we're doing things that uh, this council supports and that uh, the city, you know, the city wants to support. So, so that was that was part of the reason why we wanted to create this was uh, to help us you know, sort of better inform those types of decisions, better to direct those opportunities uh, as they come in. Uh, we've been at this, uh, I've been in this role now for, for six years, so a pretty good, pretty good feeling for, um, you know, opportunities as, as they come through and whether or not they'll be received or productive. Uh, we've had a few kind of repeat investment requests, uh, different groups that have come through with different proposals over time. So, so we have a pretty good, a pretty good sense of that. We put it through the economic development committee. Typically, if it's a, if it's a significant uh, investment, uh, get their feedback, and uh, and then look at the budget as we go forward into the future, and look at the past trends in terms of asks that have come forward, and kind of, kind of be able to assess sort of what that looks like for us in terms of future investments. We also have, uh, you know, uh, as part of that, we also have a pretty good opportunity to convince folks to flex their asks uh, that, that come our way. So uh, I, th I don't know if we've ever really supported a full ask that's ever come through. We usually go through some sort of a negotiation process to look at what we think we can support uh, given uh, our resources over time. The nice thing about how the economic development uh, reserve uh, has been 
uh, transitioned uh, in the last couple of years in terms of how it's been funded, uh, the, or the transitioning has been uh, the funding has been transitioned. Um, is that now we have a consistent look year after year uh, in terms of the exact amount that we'll have for the next uh, nine years in that reserve, and, and previous to that it was sort of basically a percentage of surplus that the city would have. In some years it was you know a nice number, a big number, and some years it was zero. So. Um, it was hard to kind of forecast, you know, as those 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 uh, opportunities arose. But we're in a much better position now. Uh, Councillor Vasic, uh, thanks for you, Councillor Bonaguar. This might be a question for Tony. Um, just thinking about the IAP two training, and um, so I noticed in this document because it's been ongoing, and the IAP two training is still pretty new. Um, I was wondering how we might be able to transition to using the term publics versus stakeholders uh, in our documents and, and if communications might be able to help with some of that wording so that we can communicate what publics means um, and, and how that is different from stakeholders so staff kind of throughout the organization don't have to muddle their way through a definition of it but if they can be supported to really understand what that means in, their, in the context of their work. Yeah, okay. Cool, thanks. Um, um, th and then just two other two other pieces. I've been thinking about the transportation transportation master plan update, which was largely the 2011 uh, one for this review because that's what exists now. So just curious about what your plans are for working with the the new plan as that kind of comes into play uh, through the economic development strategy. Yeah. So um, we we view. Um, that as, as one of kind of the, the really interesting toolboxes that we have in our selling toolbox for, for marketing the city. Um, so in terms of transportation master plans, LRT, all of those sorts of assets that we have, um, I think it, it's good that we've been in a position to have a little bit of input on, on how things evolve. Uh, and ACTEV, I, I'm learning, or have learned that uh, we do get involved in a lot of different areas within the city, which is exciting. Uh, and have some have some input, uh, but in that in that particular area, we kind of look at that as 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 uh, as something that we're now taking uh, all the good work that the city has done and, and council on making those decisions and, and making those investments, and it's really our opportunity to now take that and market that to the world. Okay, thanks. And then just last piece. I mean, obviously, really exciting that this report talks about housing affordability and arts and culture. Um, I think you said, like, if people can't live here, they can't work here. Uh, and so I think that's really important. So I really appreciate that. And really great to see arts and culture in there as well. Um, just two points that I wanted to, to, to mention. I was hoping that if you could, even though we don't want to include specific arts organizations so that we don't kind of, you know, prioritize some over the others, I really would love to see if it's possible arts organizations or relevant arts organizations, right. something like that under the partner section, because right. I just would hate to see arts organizations look at the document and see themselves missing from some of the objectives, no. not all, but some. No, and it's, it's the second uh, question that's come up today on that. Uh, and so uh, I, I get that our intention was really to focus on external groups that were sort of external to arts and culture and how they could, you know, uh, add some add some funding and add some value. Uh, but uh, it's, I don't think it's a big change to add a word that says you know, arts and culture. Uh, we'll come up with something, but something broad based that that covers the industry as a whole. Yeah. yeah. And Majewski. Well, just a big uh, thank you for the, the focus on the arts and culture industry. I've had the opportunity to uh, meet with uh, Astero and a number of uh, people in the community recently. And I think what really rings true to me is last term of council, we made the community, uh, investment in the Communitech Data Hub over five years, solidified that, brought Communitech to Uptown Waterloo, made the investment in the over four years in the Accelerator Center, which generated nearly 200 companies and helped incubate them. And then uh, I think finally we invested in Evolve Green right. over a period of years. And you think we still have Canada's to have that green incubator here, uh, clean tech incubator. And I think that's uh, exciting. And if we can take that success, which I well understood in business, and convert that into success in the arts and culture industry, mm -hmm. I think that would be a, a key um, achievement. Mm -hmm. for this term of council. So I'm um, glad to see it was listed as such a high priority and uh, wish you all the best with that and to the team all the best with that. Thank you. 
Oh, uh, so um, I, I, if there, if any other comments from council or questions? Uh, I have a few for you, Justin, if I may. Um, so overall, I mean, you state in the report that we want culture to be a strong brand here. And for that to happen, that's going to require a massive shift in how we value or revalue the arts. So I, the report is a great start on that. And I urge you to keep on working with partners to help make that shift. Um, overall, I, I to pick up on a comment from Councillor Vasic, it was, uh, I think we're missing an opportunity in this report, and that is active transportation as an economic development tool. So businesses have told me that the LRT and a connected active transit network is specifically why they have set up shop in Waterloo. So I think, and, you, and that is also a key attractor when you're trying to bring global talent to our city. But I didn't see much of it or much mention of it in the report. So I'd like to ask if it's possible to include public transit and active transportation as an actual economic development priority or tool or something like that. Yeah, I, th I think um, I think we viewed that as, as one piece to the marketing story. We talked about marketing quite at length and in terms of you know focusing on that and and actually, we've had uh, Ryan Mounsey's former older old position uh, transformed a bit, uh, and uh, we have Kristen Sainsbury who has joined us, and uh, a part of a big part of her role uh, is is marketing for for the for the team, so uh, for the for the group, so um, the group as a whole, including arts and culture. So, um, so that's that's a big that, that's kind of how we were viewing it when we were when we were building out building out the strategy. Um, that it's, uh, it, it, you know, we've done some amazing things in that space and we'll certainly focus on marketing it. Happy to add something, you know, either kind of under a marketing lens where we, I don't, I don't see us at this, to me it kind of feels like it's baked at this point in terms of building, you know, LRT, oops, sorry, LRT and, and some of the infrastructure. Uh, and, and really now we're focusing on a marketing phase of it. That's kind of how, how we view it, or I, I kind of view it. Um, certainly as more opportunities to enhance um, active transportation and whatnot, uh, we did play a role in the scooter pilot, for example. So we, we do uh, see ourselves you know, playing a role in that where, where, where necessary. But in terms of kind of where we're at today, looking at it as a, as a marketing tool. Um, so happy, happy to kind of add something on that front to kind of maybe highlight that we'll focus on marketing that as, as part of our overall uh, marketing strategy? If you could avoid actually just putting it in the marketing bucket. Um, you know, when we're looking at things like developing the, the West Side employment lands, mm -hmm. transportation and connection is going to be part of its economic vi viability. That's true. Yep. So if we can try to take it just out of just a marketing yep. bucket and uh, I don't know yet how it would fit in or, or what kind of role it would play, but I mean how we get around our city is going to impact our economic viability. Sure. So if we can try and factor that in to the report, yep. just to just to highlight that we recognize that and maybe working with other departments towards that, sure. that I'd appreciate that. Okay. We can and then I'm just going to whip through some other things that I, that I flagged. Um, I, I also really appreciate the housing affordability and accessibility being part of this. On page 18 of the report, um, I really just want to be very clear to the people who are reading this report and seeing our strategy about where our priorities lie. And it says housing accessibility, it's not listed as a priority for people at the start of the business chain. Like it's not listed as a priority for startups and new ventures. It's really only listed for established businesses. But if you can't afford a home here, you're probably not going to start a business here or a graduate's probably not going to stay here. So I, if we could include housing accessibility as a priority for fledgling as well as established businesses, mm -hmm. that would be appreciated. Sure. sure. Um, Councillor Vasic, was, I, I support your um, request as well for having arts industry included as potential partners when, we, um, when we're looking to strengthen the arts industry. Right. For on page 23 of the report, action area seven is looking at the uptown area. Um, I would posit that 
having more parking should not be one of the measures of success. Uh, that would actually go against the Uptown vision and our strategic plan. Um, active transit, better connectivity and redistributed parking might be a more accurate goal to be aiming for. Mm -hmm. And then on page 30 of the report, in objective, um, objective seven, it's speaking about your efforts to promote networking and connection for women in STEM and STEAM. As a woman who works in STEM slash STEAM, uh, I just want to add a, 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 just a small note of caution that events for women in these sectors, they're helpful, but they're something of a stopgap measure. Um, they don't necessarily address underlying systemic issues. Uh, it's called kind of, it's a fix the women approach so that it's easier for them in a broken system as opposed to fixing the system mm -hmm. so that women are equally welcome and equally successful there. So if we could please um, shift the wording to be more similar to the to objective, the objective below that where we're shifting our focus to identifying systemic barriers to uh, and opportunities for improvement. Okay. Uh, I think that would be appreciated. Yep. Okay, and then I'm, I'm looking look at, uh, so to move that, I'll look to the mayor. Okay, with, with the amendments, okay. That council approved the city water economic development strategy 2019 to 2024, including the following amendments. Include active transportation, as an attractor for global talent. Include housing uh, accessibility as a focus on priority one for startups and new ventures as well. Include the arts industry in list of partners for objective one, enhance startup and emerging arts and cultural industry support. Replace more parking as a measurement of success for action area seven with redistributed parking and review language for objective seven and shift focus to identifying systemic barriers and opportunities for improvement. Anyone care to second that? I've got Councillor Freeman. Any discussion? We'll call the vote. Those in favour? That's everyone. Okay. Okay, thank you team. Okay. And thank you Trudy, sorry I didn't introduce you at the start there. <laughs> thank you very much everyone. Okay. Uh, so we've got um, no formal or informal public meetings tonight and no consideration of notice of motion from previous meetings. No notice of motions for tonight. Uh, no communications and correspondence and no regional informational correspondence no unfinished business so we're right up to new business any new business from the horseshoe no everyone's keen to go okay so uh if we're all no no new business no questions oh. would you move to adjourn <laughs> councillor beath is ahead of us councillor freeman has a second everyone in favor of finishing up that's everyone our last ever Thank committee you. of the whole meeting uh -huh.